Hey everyone, so welcome to this new series of videos. Um, so in this series, I want to talk about a very interesting modern player, Norbek Abdisaturov. And um, so this young Uzbek player um, rose to the chess uh, elites basically uh, in 2021 when he, world, when he won the World Rapid Chess Championships uh, ahead of players like Carlsen. And since then, he's gotten really good and he's made, you know, he's leaped up to the 2750s. He's currently the world number four rated player. Um, he's won tournaments like um, the Blitz section of Norway Chess in 2023, um, Tata Steel in 2024, uh, and also uh, the Prague Chess, Chess Festival in 2024. So he's clearly a very, very strong player. And I, yeah, and there's just something that I noticed in his game, which is that he often gets this very kind of simple and straightforward position, but he manages to win those against very strong opposition. Um, when I say simple I don't and straightforward, I don't mean that it's like elementary or barbaric. I think that it's actually a compliment. It's more similar to the styles of Rubinstein and Capablanca, um, players that I've made videos on in the past, and I hope to make more videos about them in the future. Um, and yeah, it's like there's a very certain quality that I've noticed that I don't think anyone else talks about. And yeah, in this series, I want to talk about a couple of games. This first game, we, uh, we're going to look at the game he played against Anishkiri. So yeah, the game starts out with e4, e5, knight f3, and now knight f6. So uh, Giri goes for the Petrov here. Um, and of course, there are, um, there are moves like d4 in this position, um, but the main move by far is knight takes e5, pawn to d6, and now knight f3. Very standard. And the main move here is after knight takes e4 um, is for white to go either pawn to d4, but black gets a pawn in the center, and we get this very interesting symmetrical uh, position where it, it seems like black is up a tempo from like an exchange French because we get essentially an, an exchange French. Let's say we get this position d4, d5, takes, takes, knight f3, knight f6. But instead of this position, we have black um, get with the knight on e4. So black has a knight on e4, meaning that they're basically up a tempo. And now what white is arguing is that, um, sorry, after, after pawn to d4, uh, d5. In this position, what White, are, White is arguing is that this extra tempo that Black used to put a knight on e4 is actually um, more of a becomes more of a target than it is a strength. Uh, so White will target this knight with moves like bishop d3, castles, rook e1, uh, maybe pawn to c4, trying to undermine the d5 pawn, uh, which is protecting the knight. And overall, uh, there is yeah there are some interesting complications that could happen after both the main moves like uh, after bishop d3, uh, knight c6 followed by bishop e7, which is uh, the old main line. Um, and I made a video on this um, in the past. Um, and there's also the move bishop d6 here after bishop d3, uh, which Caruana favored um, when he used to frequently uh, use the Petrov. Um, and yeah, so those are two possible lines. Uh, another line that I've noticed um, really came up, I believe, in like 2017, 2018, which yeah, became really popular during that time, which is the move knight c3, the, the Nimzovich attack. And the point is after knight takes e3, d takes e3, white captures away from the center and gets these double pawns. But what they, what white is arguing is that they get the bishop out to like e3, maybe d3 or c4. And then later they can play the moves like queen d2 and long castle, going for a very interesting attack where black, where black castles kingside typically. White can try to launch the pawns up the board uh, or use their bishops to try to generate an attack. So that's a very interesting idea. Um, instead, in this game, uh, white came up with the first surprise. Pawn to c4. Now this is a very rare move, um, and the thing is that what is what is white arguing, right? So it becomes more clear after we see the moves bishop e7, very typical development. The bishop has no better square to go to, and now knight c3. This is what white is um, white is trying to fight for. White is arguing that now after after black takes the knight on c3, so it's obviously retreating here with knight f6, which just allow pawn to d4, and white gets like both pawn on c4 and d4, the knight's out, the bishop on e7 is kind of passive, so this is a slight edge for white for sure. Um, not to say that's not a play that it's not playable, but yeah. So knight takes c3 was played. This is very um, yeah very um, normal, you know, very, very typical response. And now the point is that white takes with the d pawn. So typically, uh, one of the rules is that when we want to recapture, we want to recapture towards the center, right? But if we capture towards the center, the bishop on c1 becomes quite a bad piece here because um, you need to play moves like d4 maybe to open up uh, this bishop. And then later, even on f4, it's not really doing a lot, right? Um, meanwhile, uh, after d takes e3, white can position the bishop on e3 here and actually go for the same idea 
um, as the Nimzovich attack. So in the same setup where you typically want to go for bishop e3, bishop d3, you can decide to castle short or long, and yeah, you can take the position from there. But we can compare this position to when the pawn instead of c4 is on c2, and we get the exact position from the Nimzovich attack. Um, so it's very interesting, and so we can see what White is arguing here. Um, in this position, of course, there are many moves that are possible. Knight c6, uh, knight a6 looks quite interesting, try to go to c5. Bishop f5 is playable, of course. Um, yeah, and I think bishop f5 is a very interesting move that um, is possible here. But um, yeah, I just want to look at this because this looks very logical, though it allows the move knight d4. I mean, I think after knight d4, white is enjoying a slight edge. For example, if the bishop comes back to g6, white can play the move g3 and try to position the bishop on g2 where it's kind of uncontested. So white can claim a small edge I hear, uh, here, I believe. Uh, even though it's not much, it is something. And after a move like bishop d7, trying to say that, you know, if you now play g3, now black will play c5, and the, moon, the knight will have to move away, and the black bishop will get on the long diagonal. Like, of course, this move comes with, uh, with the drawback that it weakens the d6 pawn, but if white isn't able to take advantage of it, then black is going to be doing okay. Uh, and it said the move could b3 is what I analyzed, uh, trying to put some pressure on the b7 pawn, and let's say if black doesn't want to make some weaknesses, they can play a move like queen c8, bishop d3 can happen, castles, and even a move like queen c2 here, just provoking some weaknesses on the king side. For example, if you go for g6, maybe move like h4 here is already a bit annoying uh, with going for h5 next. Uh, and instead of h6, white can go for knight f5, trying to maybe pick up the bishop here. So it becomes very interesting, um, but uh, certainly black is not worse in that kind of position. It's just that it's, uh, it's a bit unpleasant. Um, so yeah, that's what I analyzed. Instead, black decided to castle, very logical. And now white gets the bishop to d3. And so the bishop is not able to go to f5 anymore. Um, and of course, the bishop can go to g4, but it might get, it risks getting attacked with h3, and maybe black will have to give up the bishop here at some point. Uh, so black develops with knight d7 here, very typical. Um, the knight either wants to go to f6, or maybe he can go to c5 later. Um, now white plays bishop e3. And of course, there are many moves here again that are possible, but I'm sure Abdul Satorov would have something prepared against that. Uh, instead, knight f6 was played. Very logical. Um, there are some threats of maybe knight g4 here, so white takes advantage of that. Uh, it prevents that um, by playing h3. Uh, it has also ideas maybe uh, later of, of advancing with g4 uh, after white has decided to castle. Um, and so here now b6 was played. So black is trying to solve basically the last a problem piece in their position, which is the bishop on c8, by developing it to the long diagonal. Very logical. And so far, the game is pretty equal, right? Queen c2. And so this kind of shows white's intentions, right? They want to castle long, and this is very typical in the Nimzovich attack. And it's not far different, right? We drew a lot of comparisons before between the Nimzovich attack and this current system with the pawns on c c4 and c3 instead of c3 and c2. Uh, and so white still goes for the same idea. And, you know, the benefit of maybe uh, having this structure instead of the one before is that the queen has this nice spot on c2 instead of having to go to, to go to e2 um, where it's kind of on the e file maybe being exposed to rook e8 so yeah bishop e7 was played and now long castles um, black took the time here to uh, play the move h6 um, just um, yeah preventing any um, pressure on the h7 pawn giving the king some luft and now white develops their last piece rook h to e1 and so far, the yeah, you can see that it's very logical. It's very straightforward. Uh, white isn't doing anything special. They maybe made some interesting decisions with with the system of playing pawn to c4 and the knight to c3, accepting these type of doubled pawns. But you know, white has just developed their pieces out to their optimal squares. They have castled. They bring the rooks to the center. So very logical so far. Um, and now black plays the move rookie eight. And yeah, from this position, uh, maybe black is intending bishop f8. Trying to trade some bishops, uh, try to open up the rook maybe. Now white plays the move bishop d4, which is interesting. So now uh, obviously uh, at any point bishop takes f3 is not a problem, right? Because that would simply give up the strong bishop. You create a lot of dark light squared weaknesses here, and you also open up the g file. Uh, so that would be a very bad decision in general. Um, and instead of that, um, yeah, it's also possible to like you know play some waiting moves. I don't know rook b8. Um, but then white will have white always has time to improve the position with like king b1 and let's say a6 and now rook e2 trying to double up on the e file and it's like white always has some way to try to improve the position it's not just like a static um 
you know, it, it's not just like a um, position where it just looks good, but it's not really doing a lot. In this position, White can continuously improve their pieces. So that's kind of what I want to point out. So instead, um, Black uh, decided to play the move c5. It's a very radical move because obviously it weakens the d6 pawn. But the idea is that um, the bishop has no good square to go to. Like for example, if it goes to e3, I'm already considering moves like d5 here. Uh, and suddenly the bishop gets opened up, um, Black gets rid of the uh, only weakness in their position, let's say cd5 and d 5 maybe the bishop on e3 is already, um, you know, not feeling so great. Um, and so instead of that, um, White decides to play the move bishop takes f6. So first off, they're giving out the bishop pair. But the point is that after bishop takes f6, White plays the move, okay, they can they can play bishop e4 here, but White decided to play the very clever move bishop h7 first. It's kind of a tickle uh, to kind of put the king in a, in a bit of a worse position on either f8 or h8. So on h8, after this move was played, in any end games, this king would be a bit a bit further from the action, right? And so it shows that kind of white is ready to enter an end game if allowed. And now bishop e4. So even though white has given up the bishop here before with bishop takes f6, white is now removing uh, black's uh, only advantage in the position, which is the double, uh, which is the pair of bishops. So now with bishop e4, this trades off some pieces. Bishop takes e4, rook takes e4. Um, and obviously, if you take on e4 now, then it's a bit different of a situation. It's not like it's a simple exchange. Now the queen is active, and that's not really what uh, black is hoping for. Um, instead, queen d7 was played. Very typical, uh, connecting the rooks, developing. Um, and now white embarks on a journey here. They want to improve their pieces. So I think move like king b1 is very logical. But um, maybe king b1 runs into some rook takes e4, queen e4, and the rook e8, where black manages to manages to develop and uh, on the e-file, which is quite nice. So instead, white plays the move knight d2. And the idea behind knight d2 is that if you take on e4 now, you can take back with the knight, hitting the e4, uh, hitting the d6 pawn, hitting the bishop, and this is quite a nice position, right, with the centralized knight. Um, instead, black plays the move a6 here. Just a very uh, interesting move, maybe at some point preparing b5 to try to open up the a-file if, if allowed, um, also just taking control of this b5 square. Uh, white plays king b1, very normal. The king isn't feeling so safe on c1, so it goes to b1. Um, yeah, and then white and then black plays him with bishop g5. Um, so the idea here is obviously just to exchange pieces. Uh, after exchanging pieces, it would be a lot easier to kind of um, get to equality. Um, so white plays the move knight f3. Playing a move like f4 here is very interesting, but um, at the same time, it's very it's unnecessary because you kind of like make a very committal move. You're not sure if this pawn even wants to go to f4 because at the end of the day, it is weakening some dark squares, right? So, knight f3. Attacking the bishop. Bishop f6. Looks fine. And now queen d3. So the threat here is simply to take on e8, followed by taking the pawn on d6. And now, uh, it kind of puts black in an uncomfortable situation where essentially we see that white has done nothing special. It's very simple, very straightforward, but suddenly black has some problems to solve, right? And this asks your opponent questions. It asks your opponent, even in uh, equal positions, that how are you going to solve the problems that I ask? Uh, which is why uh, black already made a, um, a slight error here to play the move b5. Uh, instead, best was to take on e4, but this isn't super obvious that you want to activate the queen on e4, let's say rook b8 here, trying to go for b5, and maybe even queen e4. For example, a line that I analyzed is queen d3, attacking d6, and it seems like there's no good way to defend it. Let's say bishop e7, yeah, queen d5 here would be very nice, hitting some pawns like f7, maybe knight e5 is coming. Um, anyways, um, but black surprisingly has enough counterplay here with a move like queen e4. And now if you take on d6, then the c4 pawn will fall. Uh, also rook d8 is a problem here, with the rook on d1 being hanging, and um, white will lose some material. So instead b3 here is interesting, but now after queen e5, it turns out that black has enough counterplay because uh, even though they have this very big weakness on d6, the dynamic factors just uh, allow black to hold here. So this is what black should have done, but it's not entirely obvious if you don't see the sequence. Um, yeah, so instead black played the move, very logical move b5. And now white decides to take on e8, queen takes e8, so this is the point. Like if you, if you take with the rook, then rook takes d6, queen takes d6 would lead to a very nice endgame, right? The pawn on a6 is hanging. And and um, this is also a very weak pawn. Uh, instead, the idea is queen takes e8, because now you cannot take on d6 on account of rook d8 with a skewer here. 
So now white plays move knight d2, so they improve the knight further, and this, the point is that if you take on c4, now the knight can come to c4. Uh, the knight has also access to the e4 square, and so suddenly white gets a very comfortable position. Uh, though it doesn't seem that it's like enough to win, like it's, a not, it's not a knockout blow, right? So black played the move queen e6 here, and now white made a very good decision to play knight e4. And now, um, the idea is that if you take on c4 here, I believe white would have played the move queen d5. Um, because you cannot take on d6 with the queen, because the knight on e4 is hanging. The queen d5 here, I believe, would have been the move. Um, just, uh, you know, putting the... Uh, threatening to exchange the queens, and let's say if you take, then still the d6 pawn falls, and this, you know, these pawns are doubled, so this is not exactly what black wants. Um, instead, bishop e7 was played in this position, and so now white play again plays the move queen d5. Um, and if you take on d5, then of course, white will not take with the c-pawn, which will make the d-pawn, you know, not under pressure. Um, it would put the, you know, it would put, it would close down the file. Uh, instead, you want to take with the rook here. And after a move like rook d8, uh, clearly white has a very nice advantage here. Um, yeah, you can, you can even consider, like, not uh, caring about this pawn. Maybe, like, king c2, or maybe b3, uh, or actually maybe just king c2, because if you take on c4, then knight d2 comes, right? Um, so anyways, we get this very nice position, right? So it's suddenly from an equal position, it's like, it gets very uncomfortable. So instead, black plays the move rook d8. And here, white takes the opportunity to actually take on b5. A takes b5 and play the move f4. And so this is what I mean. It's a very simple, very straightforward. White is trying to uh, eventually liquidate into an endgame that is favorable with extra space. White's pawns are more fluid because their pawns on the king side here are not... Um, are not where the king is, right? Because black, is, black on the other hand, is not able to advance their pawns on the king side so freely because their king is over, over there. So it would not be very nice to actually, um, to actually open up the position by moving their own pawns. So white has this freedom while black has, does not. So now black plays move king g8. We see how that useful move of bishop h7 actually um, made black waste time in this end game, uh, having to go with the king to back to g8. Uh, f5 was played. And now this forces the exchange of queens. Queen takes d5, rook takes d5, king f8, and now white plays a very, very nice move. I, I love this next move, pawn to b4. Now what this does is that it just shuts, it just move, prevents these pawns from moving forward. Um, at some point there are ideas of breaking through with a pawn break, um, and also just as bishop on e7 becomes a very bad piece, and it's not easy to kind of solve the problem with this piece. Let's say even if you go to e8 after king e8, you can't really go to d7 because it maybe blunders and moves like knight c5 or like dc5, uh, bc5, right? So it's not very easy to solve the problems here. Uh, white can improve the position, king b2, rook, uh, rook d7 was played, um, and now white played the move g4. Very patient, slowly improving the position. Uh, you always want the pawn on g4, right? It doesn't make sense to leave it, th leave it on g2. So white does everything to improve the position before, um, yeah, before ever acting out. Um, drastically and so yeah that's technically that's a very good sign of a of a technical player where they just basically slowly improve the position until they can't any further and only then do they strike um, now king d8 and now white spots the opportunity here to actually break open the position with c4 so this is very nice now it leaves two pawns hanging right but the point is after if you play the move c takes b4 then after rook takes b5 uh, this pawn on b4 is weak um, yeah, and there is basically no good way to save it. Moves like king b3, you move the knight away. Um, I don't know, maybe to like... Um, maybe you can reroute it somewhere, like here. Um, you can eventually win the b4 pawn, and this is going to be a very nice advantage. Instead, b takes c4 was played. And now, white, white takes on c5, dc5, white trades into the endgame, and plays king c3. And then suddenly, we get this very, very nice endgame where white is going to get... Um, after king c6, king c4, basically a very nice uh, good knight versus bad bishop scenario. And this is like a very, very typical um, position where um, at some point a white can think about like giving up away this pawn so that later the c5 pawn drops. And then later the king is a bit more active than the black king because the black king will, be have, uh, will have to chase this pawn on a6 um, while the white king can try to infiltrate the position and win some pawns on the king side. So that's the very basic plan that we know. It's very principled and very... Um, standard if you study classical games. The bishop on e7 is also stuck to the defense of the c5 pawn. And so it's amazing that in, in yeah, like there's a simple transition from a, from an equal 
uh, opening to middle game uh, where white is basically striving to play for a slight advantage playing for a structural advantage and eventually converting that into this very favorable end game and look at let's look at uh, white's technique here king b6 a4 king c6 knight f2 white improves the position a bit further with knight d3 coming or even just um yeah after knight f2 bishop d8 uh knight e4 coming back here i don't think i think that was just a bit of a shuffle here because we are uh, yeah we've just reached move 40 41 here um and now let's say bishop e7 a5 here um trying to distract the king later on if it goes to try to chase this pawn bishop b8 a6 bishop e7 of course um black knows that okay like they have to um after a5 they can't chase the pawn here because the c5 pawn drops but now bishop e7 knight c3 trying to improve the position the position of the knight either to b5 or d5 bishop g5 knight b5 trying to advance the pawn bishop e3 h4 now not putting the pawn on the dark square because um maybe even trying to climb further maybe h4 h5 here is an idea h4 king b6 a7 king b7 h5 and so we so basically what white does is that they maximize their position fully before they actually act out on it so yeah now all of their pawns are advanced in any end game where, where these pawns are traded and the minor pieces are traded white has a clearly winning advantage here because their pawn because their king is able to eventually enter the position and pick up these pawns well, king a8 was played king d5 improving the position king b7 king d6 and on black plays c4 uh, the only way to try to muddy the waters here uh, trying to pick up the a7 pawn but after king d king d5 uh bishop takes a7 white simply trades into winning endgame knight takes a7 here so um here if you take on a7 then after king takes c4 white needs to play with a bit of caution so if you want to calculate this position to the winning uh, you know to the winning technique you can feel free to do so okay so the winning solution here is that uh, after let's say king d6 king d5 let's say king c7 trying to shield the king away here the only winning move is the break g5 and this is why you need that was, this is why we need to understand the typical pawn breaks in the position this is a very common tactic you will see like um in books about pawn you know uh, referencing any pawn breaks um um, and this g5 advance is very typical and it happens because white has so much of an advantage in space in this end game and it's not possible without that so g5 is a break is a breakthrough after let's say hg5 you play f6 gf6 and h6 and simply the pawn advances and white gets a new queen so that's the entire sequence right which is why black tried to muddy the waters here with like uh with a move like c3 trying to advance the pawn but white is fast enough here they play knight c6 and they have this nice check on a5 it's a very important detail c2 knight a5 check king c7 knight b3 and we enter this winning end game king e7 g5 and again with this breakthrough if you take then f6 wins so king e7 gh gh king e5 bearing the move f6 here f6 instead was played king d5 king d7 and on c1 where black is forced to break the opposition they have to go to they're gonna have to go to e7 where the white king will enter and yeah they're also up a knight here so it doesn't matter that this, that this knight can't get into the game it's just a useful way to get some get some more tempi uh, and break the opposition so yeah this game was like a very uh, i would say rubenstein like win or some people would say capablanca but yeah it's a very simple rubenstein like win where uh basically white plays for a structural advantage they fight against the d6 the weakness of the d6 pawn um and eventually they build a pressure they don't hurry they don't rush the position and eventually they manage to win by converting into a winning endgame so it's a very smooth win and one of the reasons that i really like abduser torab uh, as a player um yeah i think that his style in, in this game and many games that i will show going forward are very reminiscent of um, old masters a very simple play uh, very rubenstein like so yeah hopefully that makes sense um i hope you enjoyed this video um learned a thing or two and yeah, thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.